We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pagani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsuna First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Hello everyone and welcome back to a, another wonderful webinar from the School of Public Policy and the Simpson Center specifically. We are so, so excited to bring you today's topic. It's going to be an exciting one. Uh, the, the title today is Soil Carbon Sequestration. What is it and could it actually work? I should actually take a minute to introduce myself. My name is Kara Easterhouse and I'm a field editor with realagriculture.com and I will be moderating today's discussion for you guys today. Before we get deep dive into today's topic, a few housekeeping items. We're gonna have a Q&A session at the end. So please, as you're thinking of your questions, put them in the Q&A box. If there's anyone specific you would like to direct your questions to, uh, please put them in there. Remember, there are no dumb questions, so don't be afraid. We love to have your interaction, and that's why uh, we are so happy to be live today. So please put your questions in, and we will be happy to have an educated discussion with you guys. Now, if you are have to leave for any reason, this will be recorded. You can get this link. This link will be emailed to you afterwards as well will be put up on the school public policies website so we will you will be able to access this at uh, any point and get the full conversation if you have to leave for any reason or you are coming in late so never fear we can catch the whole thing now to get into today's topic you've heard the rumors that we might be able to sequester carbon emissions in soil and thereby reduce our greenhouse gas emissions it's just a big idea, one tossed around by scientists and politicians as a solution for emissions reduction from time to time. But it is also an incredibly complex idea. It's something that I think sometimes it, it baffles some of us because it, how, how in-depth it can be. So it's, it's much harder to measure the impact than say counting the reduction in liters of gasoline purchased. And the implementation has major ramifications on what we can do with our agricultural land. This is a tremendous potential to the idea of sequestering carbon emissions in soil, but implementing such a scheme would also be tremendously difficult to do. Today at the School of Public Policy, we are bringing you a wonderful presentation to be able to have these discussions, ask these questions, and really dive into what soil carbon sequestration is. I'm going to give you a little bit of background on today's speakers. So first off, we're going to get Dr. Louise Fila, who is a multi-actor systems department at the Faculty of Technology, Policy, and Management at TU Delft. He is, or sorry about that, he takes part of the team of Two Horizon Europe projects looking at land-based mitigation strategies for net zero futures as well as socioeconomic tipping points towards sustainable development with a focus on Canadian and Latin America. With his research, Luis focused on clean tech development and policy innovation for sustainable transitions. Luis is also the R&D lead of Vorsana Environmental Inc., a clean tech startup, a volunteer researcher in chemical engineering at the University of Calgary, and co-director of InnoLab Space, NGO focused on supporting community-led sustainability initiatives. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Dr. Luis Virlet. Luis, whenever you're ready, take her away. Thank you, Kara. Thank you very much. And I'm glad to be here. And thank you, everyone, for, for your interest in this topic. Um, I'm happy to, to have this fruitful discussion and conversation. So I'll be, uh, I'm going to share my screen now. And I'll be sharing with you some insights about what soil carbon sequestration is and some bit bits with regards to our research. So as mentioned, I, I have the opportunity to work at TU Delft uh, in the Netherlands, uh, from, but I'm based in Calgary on a Horizon 2020 project called Landmark, which is you looking at land-based mitigation technologies. And we've been looking at different 
land-based alternatives, including soil carbon and agricultural practices as a way of reducing our carbon emissions. Uh, I, I have to acknowledge uh, Ms. Chelsea Green, who's also been a key um, collaborator in this work and part of her results are included in this slide. So I figure that some of you are interested in learning more, but let's start with the basics. Uh, you know, what soil carbon sequestration is. So um, in, in nature, uh, we have natural carbon cycles in which carbon is emitted to the atmosphere, but also is utilized by living organisms uh, for their natural act activities and livelihoods. So when we basically that the concept of this technology or practice means like harvesting or utilizing this uh, carbon cycle and enhance its capture, capture capacity from the atmosphere. So what we're looking at is to increase the organic carbon content on the soil through improving our agricultural and land-based practices and reducing the net zero CO2, uh, net zero carbon emissions to the atmosphere. In the technical context, or at least from our research, we are, you know, more specifically referring to when we when we use this term soil carbon sequestration to particular agricultural practice that could have important impacts, such as no-till agriculture. So instead of moving like tradition have been done, and you move the soil layers layers to to put seeds uh, or fertilize, and not and not doing that actually reduces the exposure of useful carbon to, to degradation in the surface. Uh, grassland management, cover crops, silvopasture and tree, tree intercropping. So basically those mean that you, you combine different types of crops or utilize like fruit trees and, and intercalate it with other sort of species. Silvopasture means that you could uh, combine forestry, agriculture and grazing all the same. So basically you could take cattle to graze in forested areas and at the same time plant uh, different species. So those have been looked at uh, agriculture strategies uh, to improve uh, the organic content, organic carbon content in the soil. So a little bit of context, uh, and I'll be brief, but I'm happy to expand on some of this information. Um, to, to have a little context in, into into what role could soil carbon play in Canada. So uh, Canada has significant amount of arable land and is really important in the world as it is, this, you know, these, re these areas are developed that we've seen how there has been an evolution in the carbon dynamics or content of the soil in time. So what you see here is a graph of the amount of cumulative carbon, so the change in carbon from the 1981 to 2011 uh, in the different provinces. So um, the soil carbon sequestration in Canada, so if we Im improve or optimize our, our ma land management and agricultural practices to improve, increase the amount of carbon we can store in the soil, there is a potential that we could sequester 22 megatons of CO2 per year, which is equivalent to 11% of total Canadian emissions. And through time, because of the different in the evolution of agricultural practices, we have seen a dynamic among different provinces. So especially the prairie, prairie provinces has significantly increased the amount of carbon that soil can sequester, especially due to incorporation of, uh, you know, eliminating summer fallow uh, practices, which basically was means that you leave the unproductive land through a productive crop season, but instead using more perennial crops and other not tillage practices that has helped prairie provinces to significantly increase the amount of soil carbon in agricultural practice. But unfortunately on the Eastern provinces, we have seen a decrease on, on soil carbon due to switching from uh, perennial to more seasonal type of, um, of uh, crops. So as the cattle industry has reduced, uh, farmers in the East have switched to uh, oils, oily seeds, uh, oil seeds and other more, you know, uh, 
not non perennial crops that, for example, they used to grow dry grazing for um, and hay for for cattle. So that has unfortunately uh, created a reduction in soil carbon content in the east. Luckily, the the contribution of private provinces lets into a net increment in the whole. Canada and also proves that some of these you know actionable uh, initiatives can really create a very positive impact when it comes to sequestering carbon. So in terms of economics, um, when we looked at technologies to remove carbon, especially from the atmosphere, uh, it is very important that we can understand potential cost of carbon removed. And the reason being is because there could be economic incentives for those farmers who really are following um, this, this practice, and probably we'll hear more about those policies later with, with our colleague Ken. But in this case, this graph shows that different agricultural practices and alternatives, such as cover crops, tree intercropping, civil pastures, the ones I mentioned before, and it shows us the potential it could have to sequester carbon in Canada. So on the x-axis, we see uh, teragrams of CO2 per year. And you could see that cover crops could be significantly big uh, next to utilizing biochar, completing soils, but there's some uncertainties around that. Uh, nutrient management, tree intercropping. And you just see the different shades of gray that the cost could vary. So when we looked at darker colors, uh, darker gray, that means that we can achieve almost 10 teragrams for CO2 per year. So a, a significant amount, like a third of this potential with less than $10 of, uh, dollars per ton of CO2. This is very important because that tells us that based on carbon incentives or carbon pricing, economy-wide carbon pricing, it could be economic for farmers to actually create an additional source of income through increasing the amount of CO2 they can capture or sequester in their agricultural soils. So we see an increment in cost depending on challenges or, or technological changes that are needed. So we see ranges between $50 or $100 um, per ton of CO2. So, uh, however, this is pretty encouraging because most of these agricultural practices fall below the, the projected carbon cost uh, that the government has already signed up. So this is encouraging in the sense that these actions could be economic in helping us sequester a significant amount of carbon in the future. Well, right now and in the future. So when it comes to you know, land use, we cannot neglect the fact that these strategies or nature-based solutions are susceptible to risks and uncertainties, especially climate risks, which means that as the environment changes due to climate change, we are more prone to floods as we unfortunately have seen our neighbors in BC um, or droughts on which we've had this year in the prairie region, and forest fires and wildfires. These are all risk when it comes to how much certainty we can have in pursuing agricultural practices from uh, climate uh, mitigation adaptation uh, um, uh, perspective. So um, science indicates that, you know, Carnal is warming two times faster than the rest of the world and the North even more. So this could have, let's say, uh, a, a positive impact or, or it, the sum of the impact that it could have is that it would actually expand the amount of land that will be arable in the future. So as the earth warms up and Canada warms up quicker, there are current, uh, there is land in Alberta that will become arable or will become more suitable to grow a certain crops that uh, is not, they are not uh, efficient today. So that also could extend the growing season, which means that our soils could be more productive from an agricultural perspective. Uh, however, it could have an impact, negative impact in the sense that you, we could see increased droughts, floods, and wildfires. And research also indicates that what we don't have as arable land today, so that's this potential expansion. So what you see in blue 
And you could see it's very interesting that in Canada, significantly compared to the rest of the world, is one of the areas where a, a large amount of land will become arable due to a uh, changing climate. Then there we, but there's also uh, caveats to this or trade-offs when it comes to loose lost in biodiversity or increasing carbon emissions as we are going to uh, tra transform uh, uh, untouched areas into uh, productive areas, and then we will be releasing the carbon stored underneath the soil. So when we looked at benefits and trade-offs, um, so the areas in green indicate uh, positive progress, and the areas in red indicate, and this graph here indicate uh, actually more towards negative uh, declining trends. So between 1981 and to, 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 uh, 2011, right, we have seen a decrease in pesticides, nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and water pollution through the coliforms in, in, in water. But, and we have seen also increases on cover crops, um, not much wildlife impact, but, but and also the greenhouse gas emissions are, have remained relatively steady. Uh, so unfortunately, because of the way we're managing soils, our, our agricultural soils are not sequestering carbon. Actually, they are emitting carbon to the atmosphere. So to, today, agricultural land in Canada corresponds to 6% of carbon emissions, which is not, it's not small. The soil could become negative emission, which means that it would sequest, could sequester more CO2 than the one that it emits but best management practices have to be implemented. Though the use of fertilizers reduce tillage, so that, that's a, a good end. So by reducing tillage, we reduce the amount of, CO, uh, of carbon emissions. The, on the other end, we also have um, other pollutant emissions and, and impacts on, on water quality. At the same time, production of fertilizers releases a significant amount of carbon emissions. So that all adds up into the balance of how we look at the agricultural sector. So as when as mentioned, the, as, as we expand arable land or agricultural areas, we also endanger biodiversity and other important environmental ecosystem services, which they also have to be properly assessed and valued when it comes to understanding the potential and looking towards a sustainable transition without endangering food, food safety. So when it comes to future outlook, uh, there is very important actions. It's science is pretty clear about the potential of soils and the key role of Canada. But more importantly, like prairie provinces have more than 80% of the agricultural land in Canada. So it's really key to have comprehensive strategies and you know transform soils into sequestering um, the, you know, elements. But there's also efforts needed around livestock production, manure fertilizer use, and energy consumption in the sector to really reduce carbon emissions. The how to approach it's very significantly context province and specific approaches are required. Soils vary in, in quality and properties, also crops. So all of these factors need to be assessed carefully in order to have from comprehensive plans of action. The standards for greenhouse gas accounting, unfortunately, right now are not pretty strong. So there are a lot of uncertainties around how greenhouse gas emissions or carbon fluxes are properly quantified, especially around land use. This year, uh, the government has released, uh, announced it will be releasing a plan to, to create more comprehensive voluntary carbon markets. The organizations such as Gold Standard and some companies actually based in Alberta doing amazing work on helping uh, farmers and organizations to do this quantification, but uh, high uncertainty remains on proper calculation. And it's important to also understand the interaction of agriculture with other sectors, so, because carbon emissions are are should be looked at from cradle to grave, which means that you know you not need to look at the whole supply chain of the sector, and you know important actions around fertilizer production are required in order to really have a low carbon emission agricultural sector. However, I want to leave you with the message that 
is definitely possible. It's huge potential here in, in the, especially in the Prairie provinces and all across Canada. And we have the opportunity to, to really kick off uh, and take the lead on, on bringing benefits, not only on the, on the environmental and, and climate agenda, but also helping farmers to participate in carbon markets and find additional economic benefits to already very good um, economic activities. Um, I think with that, I have finalized my, my short presentation. I know you probably have a lot of questions, but I'm happy to, to uh, have further chat with you during the Q&A section. And there's some part of our contact information for the Landmark Project for those who would like to follow up. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Luis. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there, there are some questions coming in. So I am seeing them. Thank you very much. We will get to them right after the next presentation. As I said, we have two panelists today. So we're going to head on over to the second panelist. But uh, refer, be sure to keep those questions coming because we would love to have that discussion afterwards. So without further ado, I'm going to bring in Dr. Jen Siodorva. She is a postdoctoral associate at the School of Public Policy at University. University of Calgary. Her special area of expertise is collection, documentation, and utilization of Indigenous and local knowledge in wildlife management, science, and industrial development in Canada, the U.S., and Siberia, Russia. Her research also involves the analysis of environmental impact assessments in the U.S. and northern Canada. Jen holds a doctorate in political science, specifying in international relations and comparative politics from the University of Calgary, Alberta, Canada, as well as has a Master of Arts from the University of Alaska Fairbanks, a lot, and a Bachelor of Law from Northeastern Federal University in Russia. She identifies herself as an Indigenous Siberian from Russia. She spent more than seven years doing research on Indigenous politics in the Arctic and traditional knowledge. So, like I said, without further ado, Dr. Siodorova, whenever you are ready. Thank you so much, Kara. Um, and thank you for having me today. So I'm going to talk more about the policy perspectives of the um, soil carbon sequestration. And as Luis mentioned, the soil carbon sequestration is more like a circular process when the certain amount of uh, carbon dioxide is being absorbed as an outcome of the photosynthesis process. And I'm saying circular because also certain amount of carbon dioxide is being emitted by respiration into the atmosphere. So in this regard, my main message would be that um, Soil carbon sequestration is not only the issue of climate change mitigation, but because it has to deal with soil carbon accumulation, but also matters that it boosts soil productivity. So it gives certain benefits to farmers and also it gives certain benefits for them in terms of like uh, carbon offset regulations. And also, as Luis mentioned, that soil carbon sequestration is good for agriculture because it increases resilience to floods and droughts. So it gives some benefits in terms of regulation of natural disasters that, can, that could always happen. So at the federal level in Canada right now, we deal with two very important documents. The first is a recently adopted Pan-Canadian Framework on Clean Growth and Climate Change, which identifies soil carbon sequestration as one of the topics and one of the issues of na in nature-based solutions. And specifically in the Canadian context, three different sources have been identified by these documents as um, carbon sinks. So we're talking about forestry, we're talking about agricultural land use, and we're also talking about wetlands. And also I, I wanted to mention that in a more like a global context, oceans also a large source of, um, uh, I would say that large carbon sink source. And when we're talking about the federal regulation, it's more like um, the encouragement, to, uh, encouragement to, for federal, provincial, and territorial governments to cooperate together. So that being said that uh, federal policymakers trying to kind of regulate land use and conservation measures in order to advance greenhouses, gases management practices. So right now, this particular moment at the federal level, it's mostly through no-till agriculture management. 
And that's the main technique that is being used for soil carbon sequestration. So the second document that also has been adopted quite recently is called the Federal Greenhouse Gas Offset System. And it's more about the attempt to quantify greenhouses gases emissions that it could provide some benefits to farmers. And this particular document has been just recently released um, uh, in 2020. And it's um, according to these documents, uh, soil carbon sequestration is one of the particular ways to um, imagine how carbon offsets could be paid off to the farmers. So it's more like right with other three elements, soil carbon sequestration has been identified as a way for farmers to mitigate climate change outcomes. And so at the federal level, I would also say that uh, there is definitely a difference in terms of climate, change, climate conditions for farmers because, for example, in eastern Canada, there is a high moisture. So that being said, some of the agricultural techniques such as no-till management, they are considered to be less efficient than in Western Canada, because in Western Canada in Paris, we deal with more like a dry soil. So those regions are considered to be dry, and that's why no-till management agriculture technique is more efficient in the Western Canadian context. So it generates more uh, carbon sink. And if you look at two different types of land, for example, if you have soil which is red, that means that this particular soil doesn't have much of carbon in it. And if you look at the specifically dark brown soil, that means that this particular type of land has a lot of um, uh, soil. And actually, uh, dark brown soil is called chernozem, which derived from the Russian word chernozem, which means dark and soil. And if we look at the Albertan map, we can say that the large amount of chernozem is concentrated in um, I would say central Alberta, so near Red Deer, as, as well as in Calgary in southern Alberta. So you can see that a lot of farms that are located predominantly near Calgary, they have a lot of potential for soil carbon sequestration. And I've also, also argued that since the year 2000s, Alberta soils have sank more carbon than emitted. So that being said, Alberta has a lot of potential in terms of soil carbon sequestration. So the specific provincial regulation that's been adopted specifically in Alberta is called the Conservation Carbon Protocol, and it identifies um, no-till management agriculture practices specifically very efficient measure to increase the amount of soil carbon in soil. And since I mentioned so many times what is no-till management, uh, just for those who don't know about it, it's more like a technique for growing crops without disturbing the soil through tillage. So that's how chernozem can be easily generated. And it's actually really good for mitigating climate change. And also it's really good for productivity of land use. Uh, next slide, please. So you can see that it's more like a circular process. And in terms of the agricultural land use, we're also dealing with livestock. So that being said, that animal they eat crops, they eat grass, and through their animal waste, there's also certain production of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And you can see that there are many also different ways of dealing with uh, soil carbon sequestration. So no-till management is not the only option for agriculture. Because for example, grazing, rotating grazing technologies, when for example, if you imagine like the pasture, and if it's divided by four sections, each of these sections is called paddock. So if you move cattle from one paddock to another paddock after about 50 or 70% of the cover is being removed, that being said that you produce much better land and more carbon can be sank into soil. And also there's, um, uh, can you please go to the next slide? There is another documentary which is called The Carbon Cowboys and it's about the farmers in the United States and uh, Southern Canada. And this particular documentary is about how some farmers decided to adopt the special grazing rotation technology. So they basically move their cattle from one paddock to another paddock to generate more soil carbon sequestration. And they, they also said that that's how the ancient buffalo in Alberta uh, grazed during the ancient times. So they tried to kind of imitate the same technology. And it's um, about like after every 25, 30 days, this particular, um, the paddock is being kind of like regenerated again. 
So that's how you basically produce more efficient soil in th this particular area. But also it's one of the policy gaps that's not uh, being recognized neither at the provincial level nor at the federal level. And we can say that grazing rotation technologies is a great alternative to no-till management, and it should definitely be uh, recognized by the federal and provincial legislatures, legislations. And there is also East versus West issue when like it has to deal more, more with um, di different climate conditions when some regions in Western Canada, they are more dry, so they sank more carbon and some eastern regions in eastern Canada, they are more like moisturized. So that being said, that produce they they like the soil in these regions sinks less carbon than in western regions. And um, talking from policy perspective, since it's not being recognized by the federal legislation, there should definitely be a difference in terms of how different um, uh, how different carbon offsets are being generated in different parts of of the country. So it's why East versus the West is definitely not only a technological problem, but also it's a policy issue as well. And it should be recognized at the both federal and provincial levels. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Louise, I see you are already as well. So we do have some questions coming in here that we can uh, get the uh, conversation going now. I did see one question was in there on whether we should use the Q&A or the chat. Uh, Q&A is great. If you have any questions, put them in the Q&A box. So that is terrific. Now we're going to hop into the first question here. It says the Alberta Conservation Cropping Protocol is ending December 31st, 2020. Is it being replaced by a similar one at the federal level? Do you have any thoughts on that, maybe, Dr. Jen? So I just looked at the any updates on the um, federal and provincial websites. I looked at the federal website and also looked at the provincial, the government of Alberta website. So it still says that the issue is in development. So not much, not much has been done in terms of like adopting more like different legislation. So no updates. Okay, and kind of a follow up to that, uh, what impact do you think this will have on conservation cropping in Alberta? I think we, it seems that we have lost Cara, but Jen, do you, are you able to hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, so car is frozen, but maybe Jen, are you able to answer the question? So the what's the impact of uh, potentially losing this this um, policy and the efforts that already are, are going on with conservation cropping in Alberta? So I would say that in terms of conservation cropping in Alberta, it's more about like uh, the attempt to quantify the amount of the carbon offsets produced in the province. And I think that in some way it's um, more like a developing policy issue that has not been studied much yet, because uh, even in Canada, nature-based solution is a relatively new political issue. So that's why like, we can't definitely say for sure that this is a topic that's going to be considered during the recent, like during the next few months, for example. So I would say that conservation cropping protocol is very important for uh, the province, but at the same time, because it doesn't necessarily explicitly show the benefits to the farmers. I don't think it's the number one policy issue for the province. So that was like my understanding. That's how I read the legislation. And um, one of the issues that's related to soil carbon sequestration, it doesn't really show what type of benefits would come to the Western farmers. So that's why it's very important to kind of demonstrate potential financial incentives to the local farmers to motivate them to adopt no-till management to adopt like different technologies such as rotating, raising technologies, et cetera. And um, from the economic issues, it's still not clear how much carbon offsets can be generated as the result of soil carbon sequestration. So that's why like, I think it's um, definitely an issue that's very uh, political. It's very topical in terms of the legislation, but because um, there's not enough economic research on this particular topic, we can say that the legislation is definitely kind of, um, the process of the decision-making is very slow in terms of um, soil carbon sequestration. 
sorry, my internet keeps popping in and out here. Of course, that's how she works when you need to be alive. But uh, another question here uh, for Louise actually is, can you elaborate more on what silvopasture is and how this could realistically be used in somewhere like Alberta? Sure, yeah, so silvopasture, as I mentioned, it, it involves grazing in forested, like having a forested area mixed with cropping area and having the cattle graze within that. And I, I, as I, I am not, I don't have uh, first-hand information of that, but I have found information that is already being used in Alberta and is being flagged as a high potential for Alberta to you know, have uh, more sustainable grazing practices. So I, I, it is my understanding that it's already been implemented and it's my understanding there are incentives from, uh, from uh, helping farmers to, to incorporate these practices. I hope that answered the question. Yep, you bet. Now uh, over to Jen, where do you see the largest policy gap between East and Western Canada? What's when it comes to this sort of thing? So the thing is like, I would say that carbon offsets regulations at the federal level do not see, do not really identify the difference in terms of the uh, soil carbon sequestration. And, and I would say that there is not enough statistical information how exactly, how much exactly Western and Eastern farmers generate soil carbon sequestration. So that's why I like, um, because there, there is a lack of actual technical and statistical data, the federal legislation treats both Western and Eastern farmers equally. Whereas like as Luis mentioned before in his presentation, Eastern farmers unfortunately generate much less carbon than Western producers do. So that's why there is not enough incentives for Western farmers to change their agriculture techniques because they basically get paid the same. And if I, if I may jump on that, Kara. Um, you know, the, the evolution we've seen, at least from the East, is responding also to economic context, right? So based on the economic possibilities, they shift off to a different crop that actually led in a reduction in soil carbon. So we are talking here about a very complex context in which farmers need to, you know, make a living. They need to keep being competitive in, in, in a global economy with the products that are on demand. But the challenge is actually facilitating that as the world transitions in a low carbon economy. So I, I see that and, you know, complementing from Jen's comments, you know, there are really not comprehensive policy for the startup, but we've seen some good um, indications. I, I, it's, it's, I've heard, I mean, this can be confirmed, uh, hopefully by someone in the audience that I I've heard the Alberta, the, the province of Alberta was working in, in some sort of uh, policy framework for nature-based solutions, at least on the agricultural. I hope it is really necessary that, that we can you know, have such thing to move forward quicker. At the same time, see if voluntary carbon markets uh, become more available. And as Canada is deploying its own uh, carbon market regulation, hopefully farmers are allowed to, to come in and, and benefit from, from these opportunities on, on evaluating the, the sequestering value they are providing to society. Absolutely. And the next question here is for uh, either of you can answer here. It says, has there been any research on the intentional use of biochar as an animal bedding ingredient as a method of improving agricultural compost, nutrient management, and for SCS in Canada or the Western provinces? Luis, you're nodding your head. Maybe you have some uh, thoughts there. Yes, yes. Thank you for the question. So, sure. Uh, ways on our research is quite interesting and we're looking into that in more in depth because there was a huge hype maybe some people remembered very well around biochar and impl implementing biochar for soil completion as a way and a route to to increase uh, uh, soil carbon and also uh, use it as a carbon sequestration alternative however we saw around you know five years ago a lot of these efforts stopped and we found studies that show that the results on biochar were inconclusive. So apparently some areas where experiments were done didn't really result in a ultimate carbon like positive effect. So meaning that the carbon sequestration wasn't as expected. 
some areas did. So, and, and I remember seeing studies from Saskatchewan and Alberta. There's also concerns on biochar degradation because as biochar is an organic compound, microbes and, and microorganisms will, would, could eat of it. So there's concern of permanency of biochar and therefore uh, it's been, there are being raised concerns around the likelihood of biochar of being um, a sequestration strategy. However, uh, there's more student studies needed. And what we see as very interesting from biochar perspective is our colleagues in Stockholm have uh, looked at the Stockholm biochar project where they have a pretty interesting circular proposal to use biochar as an energy source and also as, uh, as a way of utilizing on Stockholm gardens. So there are opportunities, but further research is necessary to, to get more information um, and valuing carbon in different ways. So permanency is a big factor. Some nature-based solutions have long permanency, but low um, capture rates or sequestration rates, whereas others have large sequestration rates, but maybe a shorter permanency. So those are factors that in our we are studying how could they be added in how carbon, the carbon that is sequestered is valued. So comprehensive policies can be proposed. So I would also, I would also add yeah. to that in the policy context, biochar is mostly treated as a fertilizer. But the thing is, like, it's a very, very, I would say, expensive fertilizer because the production of biochar is a very uh, sophisticated technology. And there are currently like um, two machines located in Alberta in small towns. So the production of biochar requires specific technology. But at the same time, I would say there is a lot of potential in terms of the research when it comes to the production of biochar. The, the researchers from the University of Alberta are currently working on the biochar production project. And also there is an indigenous, um, indigenous company that applied for the federal funding to study how to produce biochar on indigenous lands. So I would say that this particular research topic is very, um, I would say it's still in the process, but still it's very interesting for researchers. So unfortunately we, we, we have lost our, um, our moderator, <laughs> but we'll do our best to keep the conversation and we still have questions in the Q&A, so please keep them rolling. We still have some time and happy to, 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 to discuss as many as we can. So maybe I'll, I'll go back to the first one. So uh, I read a, a question here. So it's about um, in our history, did Canada follow poor, poor practices, reducing carbon content over time or have recovered from that point? If not, how much improvement could we see percentage of original content of, of example? So just to refer, if you've been able to see, we have references from um, the Canadian carbon, Soil Carbon Index, where we see that uh, the, the amount of carbon sequestered in, in Western or Prairie provinces have increased due to an improvement in agricultural practice, whereas in the East haven't. So, so far, soils have never been negative emissions, which means that we haven't really improved much uh, because we need to, be, if we look at the problem from a nationwide perspective. However, in the Prairie provinces, it, there has been significant improvement and that's what's driving the positive um, impact uh, that we see today. Maybe Jen, would you, do you have any more reference on, on these questions about historical, historical um, performance of Canadian soils or Canadian agriculture? I would say definitely this particular um, policy issue when Western farmers produce more soil carbon sequestration than Eastern farmers do is also shaped by West versus the East historical context. So we cannot really say for sure whether it's true or not. And we can also say that climate definitely influences the production of uh, soil carbon sequestration. But at the same time, there's, as, as already mentioned, the lack of statistical data. And the reason why we're talking about East versus the West, that it's, it's, it's not only, I would say that the soil carbon sequestration issue, but it's also, it's a historically developed issue that makes this topic more, I would say like emotional because it's, um, I read recently the new article from the Western producer and it says that it's, it's kind of like, um, it's like a bomb when it comes to the legislation. And that's why I like um, 
providing more economic data on that, providing more statistical information on how what's what's the amount of actual difference between the production of soil carbon sequestration in the West versus the East would definitely contribute more to this particular discussion. Thank you very much. I, uh, I We are having some sort of windstorm here and it is causing all sorts of issues. I, I sincerely apologize to anyone watching. Um, so anyways, these are some great comments. Thank you, Louise, for hopping in here. Uh, I, we have a question coming in here regarding animal feed. It says there have been studies on animal feed reducing carbon emissions. Do either of you know if Alberta is working on a policy regarding this? Unfortunately, I don't have information on animal feed. I apologize, but definitely an interesting thing to look into. I'm not sure, Jen, if you would have. I have, I don't know actually anything about it. No worries. Now, Louise, you had mentioned biochar and there's somebody in the Q&A here as saying, I'm not familiar with biochar. Could you please describe what the process is? Is that something you could elaborate a bit on for the audience? Of, of course, my pleasure. So um, biochar is the product of processing wood or biomass in the absence of oxygen. So when you, pile, you know, paralyze at mild conditions wood, you will get this carbonaceous product called biochar, which is rich in carbon and uh, porosity is relatively low. What you've done is remove moisture and some of the volatile organic content of, of it. So what, what has been proposed for biochar is that you could utilize it as soil completion alternative. So when you put biochar in the soil, it's been, um, it's been proposed that it helps retain moisture in, in certain type of soils, which helps with crops. Also, it helps with retention of other nutrients such as phosphorus and nitrogen. And it's been, it's been researched that it could increase crop productivity. There are many ways of using biochar as, a, as again, as an energy source, right? So we are familiar with wood pellets as a heating source. Biochar can also do be. So what you do when you process this biomass that could be, you know, waste, could be wood uh, ships, could be residues from forestry. And what you do is that you remove volatiles in water, right? The volume reduces. So there is a way easier to transport and less expensive. And then you can still use that carbon content as, as a heat source of fuel. Uh, there are many other things uh, biochar can be used for. Uh, could be an absorbent, depending on, on the conditions. It's, it's, called, it's been tested for soil restoration. Um, but as I said, as a sequestration strategy, this is very important to account for carbon footprint all across the supply chain. So because making biochar, it requires high temperature. Uh, you are, you are con consuming energy in that step. And then you need to transport it. You need to utilize a machinery to incorporate or mix it with the soil. The, um, then, uh, uh, so these, these activities have a carbon footprint on its own. So the, the balance of the amount of carbon you're putting as biochar on the, the ground versus the amount of carbon that was released to make it um, not needs to give you the, the right math, right? It needs to actually tell you that you are going to be sequestering carbon that way instead of releasing carbon to the atmosphere. Um, I hope that answers the question. If not, you you will have my contact information. I'm happy to to answer some of these questions by email later. Another comment that kind of came in regards to a previous question, um, University of Lethbridge and Agriculture Canada did parallel studies on the use of biochar as a feed additive in a cattle feedlot and subsequent application to cropland, examining the efficacy of biochar and the capture of volatile gases in manure. The studies were published in February 2020, so if anyone's looking for more information on that, that would be the place to look. Now, we do have a question here. Let me pull it up. Uh, what other mechanisms for creating value or incentivizing farmers for certain practice changes beyond offset markets or subsidies? 
Also, you speak about a con comprehensive approach to policy. So what do levels of government need to do to take a more comprehensive approach to policy? Maybe Jen, you have some comments on this? Definitely, Alberta, in comparison with other provinces, has the most progressive carbon offset policy. But also, as I mentioned in my presentation, only no-till agricultural management has been recognized as one of the ways to provide more soil carbon sequestration, generate more carbon offsets. And I think that if, if the provincial government would, I don't know, like recognize the other techniques such as um, rotation grazing technology and intensify farmers to adapt to this particular technology in order to kind of change the way how agriculture is being managed, managed nowadays, I think that there would be a definitely a great contribution to soil carbon sequestration. So definitely there is a lot of space for development and there is a lot of space for the changes in the legislation. But definitely Alberta has the most potential in terms of development of more comprehensive carbon offsets legislation, including soil carbon sequestration as one of the methods. And if, if I may jump in, Tara, uh, I, I'm just thinking another way of, of you know, providing more um, benefits or incentives for farmers could be of branding products for consumers related to its sustainability. So we also see the power of consumers. And because these are consumer products, if you are able to offer an agricultural product that has a lower uh, environmental impact, that you know, you could argue that could be a prime for consumers that are drive to support this, this type of initiatives. Also, uh, if you looked at agricultural products to, to as supplies for an industrial activity or a company, we see a, a, growing, a growing interest in SEG, so environmental, social, and governance indicators on the private sector that is really driving investment. Therefore, a company that is committed to sustainability targets, you know, could make use from agricultural products that have a lower environmental impact and make it as a way of the strategy on, on which the private sector would also benefit. Since investors are putting more pressure and seeing serious action from an, uh, sustainability perspective, commitments from, from, from companies. I would also say maybe like more like civil society bottom up approach would work because uh, there is a documentary on YouTube, which is called Carbon Cowboys that I mentioned in my presentation. And there is a case study from Alberta, Canada. There is a farm near Calgary. So they practice innovative technologies in order to generate more carbon dioxide in soil. And they also said it prevents floods and drought. They also show, showed the difference between um, the land that was um, cultivated according to more like um, traditional technologies and the land that was cultivated according to more like innovative technologies. So there is a, definitely a big difference. So the land that it's on the right that's as using the specific like um, rotating grazing technology is darker. So that means that it generated more soil carbon. So if you're interested in kind of like how farmers can develop different innovative technologies, I would recommend you to go to YouTube and watch this documentary. Thank you very much for your comments. Now, Louise, you mentioned addressing livestock production in your future outlook. Can you further elaborate on what you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, in the, in the presentation, what it meant is that when looking at soil carbon uh, sequestration as a practice or an a strategy for carbon sequestration, you need to also account for potential impact of livestock. And uh, so we haven't, I, I haven't focused my research on livestock or uh, specifically, but the, the whole point I wanted to make on that slide was we need to look at those sectors as part of the inter intersectionalities with the, the soil carbon itself, because it's really inter intertwined with, with livestock management. But I'm not particularly looking at that on my research. And so I, I figured that people in the audience will probably know way more. And, and Kari, if I'm jumping, because there's a question, uh, I think is, I, I, I like to, to make sure I can answer due to time. Um, so there are, there's a question on um, cover crops and, and 
the in you know terminology may vary, but basically planting trees. And um, I just wanted to to refer to that one specifically. And yes, uh, uh, well, I seen shelter belts. And and just to my answer to this question, and definitely uh, they can help for moisture retention, um, animal passages. So it, they 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 have proven that cover crops improve productivity, uh, decrease impacts of the biodiversity, help with moisture retention, and reduce flood risk and erosion on the soil. So that's why it's food, it, the benefits can only be cannot only be seen from a carbon emissions side, or and that's what's interesting about land. And that, that's what I'm loving about working on these projects, is that you know we all have a personal relationship with land. It really means a lot to us for, for many reasons. And it's not only we, we cannot only see things from a carbon perspective or a climate change perspective. There are all other important uh, factors that we need to account for when moving forward uh, a more sustainable uh, activity. So yeah, on, on that uh, question, I hope I have answered what the person in the audience wanted to know. Absolutely. And we're going to hit one more quick question here. So I'm just going to ask for some quick responses. But uh, how do we activate producers when they are paid so little for the product that they produce already? I'm worried that policies will only harm farmers and ranchers and see gains for later in value the chain in the value chain, such as meat producers, large companies, etc. Leaving farmers to foot the bill without increasing the price they receive for their work. Do you either of you have any quick comments on that? Jen or Louise? If not, that's okay, we can move on. Would you, would you please repeat the question, Kara? You would like to repeat the question? Yes, please. Okay, so the comment is, uh, how do we activate producers when they are paid so little for the product that they produce already? And as you mentioned, I know Louise, you mentioned in your presentation too, that it's not, there's not the huge payback there. So this, uh, this attendee is saying, I'm worried that policies will only harm farmers and ranchers and see gains for later in value that in the value chain, such as meat producers, large companies, etc., leaving farmers to foot the bill without increasing the price they receive for their work. So how do we activate those producers? Uh, I really like that question. And I think that concern is very genuine on, on working on um transition strategies. We wanted to, oh, we also talked about a just transition, right? We wanted to, to make sure we moving uh, to, a, to, a, to a more sustainable future, but we're not leaving people behind. And we definitely, I don't think it's, it's anyone interest to have the bill on the farmers. I, I think that I, obviously poly, there's many type of policies and Jen can speak about that better than me. But when the policies I see directly is that we have a carbon pricing. So we currently are assigning a social cost of carbon, which farmers are paying as we all are. But at the same time, I see the opportunity of farming actually benefiting from the fact that we are all contributing to the damage that CO2 emissions have, but the farmers are actually are, are helping on that fight. So farming activities are helping us sequester carbon they can be better, they can be more with the right support. So what I like, what I love to, I, I cannot speak in detail, but what I really like to see are policies that understand that dynamic and actually enable farmers to, to gain benefit from the fact that we have an economy, all the economy is paying for this carbon, but farmers in their activities, some that do things, uh, I know that they are following the right practices can, you know, benefit and receive additional primes or, or income from their contribution to removing carbon emissions. That's what I love to see. I mean, how that works, <laughs> maybe Jen can speak more on, on the policies. I would definitely say that um, I noticed that during the last federal election in Canada, only one political party was interested in investing money into nature-based solutions. And other um, parties, they were more interested in other ways of adaptation, mitigation to climate change. And I think that investing about like $1 billion, as one political party mentioned, would be the way to go. That's how like maybe some of the policy measures to intensify farmers to produce more soil carbon sequestration could be uh, adopted. But other than that, I would say 
nature-based solution is very kind of outlooked topic that should def that definitely deserves more policy attention. Okay, and unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. That went by really quick, you guys. There was some uh, really great questions, and I know we didn't get around to answering all of them, but uh, as we said, uh, and I'm sure Dr. Sidorva said as well, we can. Uh, there's the contact info, and you can reach out further for questions, but thank you very much for participating today, and thank you to our panelists, and we will see you guys all sign up for uh, December 7th, that will be the next Simpson Center webinar. So please sign up for that one. And if you only caught part of this presentation or you wanna go back and watch it again, please be sure to check out the recorded version. We will have it up on our YouTube page and as well on our website. So thank you very much. And uh, we will talk to you guys all soon.